but I want to introduce to you Mike Rogers. Mike, would you come on up here? Mike is the person who is the catalyst for the Love First Revival. He's got a great story to tell about how he intersected with Don, but uh, Mike is going to uh, introduce Don McLaughlin to us tonight. I've got to do this because I don't think I've ever been on TV before and we're streaming this, so I want to say hi. Hi, 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 hi out there. I, 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 I've, I know that my, uh, I've got my daughter and her husband in Dallas that are watching and uh, other friends and family uh, across the country. So uh, welcome to Genesis and to Love First Revival. I, I uh, like I do most things by accident, I found Don through a friend, a, a childhood friend. Uh, I went out to see him at his church, Cornerstone Church of Christ. And he's sitting right there, Keith. Um, I, I had it on my mind. We had been operating our nonprofit for uh, about a year and a half. And this love thing and leading with love was, was just on my mind. And it was coming up. You know, you open the scripture and because you're thinking that, you'll see it everywhere. That's where, where my head was. And I, I wanted to understand more about it and study it more. And so I had been looking for a book and I just went out to give Keith a hard time uh, one afternoon. And I said, I've been looking for a book on love. And of course, you know, what do you know? But he goes to his bookshelf in his office and says, try this one out. And it was a book written by Don McLaughlin. And the title, uh, it's not very long, Love First Before It's Too Late. Ending hate, yeah. So I was, uh, I mean, it hit the sweet spot. I loved it. Uh, it just resonated with me. The, the phrase is not a phrase, it's a way of life. It's if, if you lead with love and you love first, then uh, you're off to a good start every day. I had to figure out who, who was behind writing this book. I'd never done that before or, or since, call, call the author. It's not hard to find somebody in these day and times. And I got on the internet and I was had his number in about a minute, and I called him. And, and uh, uh, this was about two and a half years ago, and he didn't answer, but he called back real quick and uh, introduced myself. And one of one of the first things he says, and I, I'm I, this guy. I've got him up, up here at this point. And then he tells me he's a Georgia Bulldog fan. <laughs> so it lowered, it lowered a little bit, just a little bit. I had to pause for a second because we're talking about love first here. <laughs> right? And so uh, over the, it's been a wonderful journey with, with uh, my friend Don and uh, Susan. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. They, they have a lovely family of five uh, grown kids and four grandkids and they've been in ministry for 41 years I believe and it just so happens they've been married about 41 years they actually met they're, they're both they're, they're not from Arkansas but they went to a school in Arkansas Harding University and, and that's where they met and so we've just been praying about what what can we do because we, we started talking a lot about community his community in North Atlanta, our, our community in, in Northwest Arkansas, particularly stomping grounds here in South Fayetteville, comparing a lot of stuff. And it was just, it's just been a wonderful time. And, and uh, through prayer and through timing, God's timing, uh, they are here. And we're thankful that they're here. And I'm, I'm uh, excited to be in the audience to participate and listen. So Don, you're on. It is so good to be with you for a thousand different reasons. And so first of all, I want to thank you for letting me be a part of this tonight. I'm as excited as you are to hear about these ministries. I've already got to hear some. I knew who Christina was ahead of time. Of course, I knew them as well. I cornered her last night to learn as much as I could because we're learning from you as I hope that we can share with you. We're doing both. Uh, now, let me give a little background 
Uh, I'm from Portland, Oregon. My wife is from Indiana. Uh, she grew up in church. Mine was a little bit different journey. Uh, my dad told me, after I flunked out of college my first year in our, Oregon, he said, uh, if you'll go to Harding University, I'll pay half your way. I heard the half your way part, that's the big sell. I said, well, where is it? He said, it's in Arkansas. I said, where is that? I'm from Oregon, right? And so I made my way down here in 1980. Uh, I came down here. I'm the first boy to go to college from my family. So I didn't really understand the whole college process, but I knew I had a chance, a fresh shot in life. I wanted to make the most of it. November 30th of 1980, I met my wife, Susan. So she'll raise her hand. I met my wife, Susan. Uh, she walked in the library, and I lost my mind. And I'm still losing my mind. We've been married 41 years. As they said, we've got five adult children. Our daughter is the youngest. She's 34. We have a son that'll turn 40 uh, in the spring, and the other three boys are in the middle. Uh, the other thing I learned is that there's a thing called a game between the Razorbacks and Texas. <laughs> I didn't know about this. I didn't understand this. I'm from Oregon. We can get more people to a volleyball game than a football game. But when I came down here and I realized that this is bordering on a national holiday when that game took place, and uh, it taught me a little bit uh, just about how people could figure out how to love each other at the end of the game, not just at the beginning of the game. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Now I live in Georgia. Uh, I see how the SEC functions, see? The SEC is like people that they squabble as siblings and then they'll fight for their cousins. This is how the SEC works, and I understand this now. It took me a little while uh, to figure that out. We are also so thankful tonight for the spirit that resides in this place in this community, in this church. So let's dive in. What in the world does it mean to love first? I want to give a couple of definitions on the front end, and I want you to think about this very carefully. When I would hear people say, I love you unconditionally, there were people I believed that from. I believed them. I absolutely did. There were a few people in my life that had kind of stood by me in the absolute toughest of times. And so when they said they loved me unconditionally, I didn't resist that thought. I'll bet you love someone unconditionally. And I hope that you meet someone that loves you unconditionally. But then later on in life, I began to figure out that we threw that word around too loosely. People would say, I love unconditionally, but then I would watch their lives then I would realize you're not meeting the conditions of unconditional love. Let me give you what I'm talking about. You ever got into a room, into a house of worship, a school, a place at work, your home, and thought to yourself, someone needs to turn on the air conditioner. Too hot in here, too muggy in here. You ever had experience like that? You can tell whether the air conditioner is on. You can tell if the air is being what? Conditioned. Right? So you say to someone, honey, check the, check the thermostat. Hey, sweetheart, check the thermostat. Hey, Joe, you check the thermostat? Will someone turn on the AC? My wife and I have been married 41 years. If you can solve the thermostat issue in America, you, or in a marriage, you can settle in Middle East peace. Right? I mean, this is tough, right? But you know what I mean when I'm talking about conditioning. And what I started realizing was, is that people would talk about unconditional love without meeting the conditions of it. The Bible talks about the conditions of love, that love is patient, and it's kind. Love isn't proud. It doesn't boast. Love doesn't keep a record of wrong. And I started noticing that people that proclaimed unconditional love didn't keep those conditions. When push came to shove, when things were difficult, when they had to give up something, when someone really annoyed them, when someone believed different, thought different, lived different, then all of a sudden, all that idea of not keeping a record of wrongs and all that went right out the window. So I turned that mirror on myself, and I said, well, what about you? 
You say you love your children unconditionally, your neighbors unconditionally, people in your church unconditionally, the people you work with unconditionally. But do you? So that's the first thing that started percolating inside of me. Is what does it mean to live unconditional love? What are the conditions of unconditional love? The second thing I had to ask myself was this. What is hate? What in the world is hate? Because if I ask you, do you hate anybody? You might think to yourself, I don't hate people. How many of you have had that thought? I, you know, I don't hate people, right? I don't hate anybody. Have you had that thought? I don't hate anybody. Or somebody said to you, you need to love your enemies. Who are your enemies? You're thinking, I don't think I have any enemies. But here's something fascinating about that word hate. Jesus tells a story where he says, unless you hate your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, even your own self, you can't be my disciple. How weird is that? You mean to tell me that I should have emotional viciousness toward my mom in order to follow Jesus? You say, no, you missed point. Yeah, that's because one of the other gospels says, unless you love me more than mother, brother, sister. You see, the Greek word for hate is the same as the English word for hate. It has different applications. You can hate a certain kind of ice cream. You get what I'm saying? And what that means is, is that you prefer it less than others. The actual word in the language of your Bible is written in. For the word hate, it means to neglect by degree. It means that when you choose Jesus over everything else, you're neglecting these other things by degree. So what we notice in Scripture is that hate is actually a way of ignoring people who need your love. It's a way of loving other things in your life more than you love the people that you could serve. So strangely enough, I could end up hating someone just by choosing to ignore them. I didn't understand that. So this makes a little more sense of the text we're going to look at tonight. I'd ask you to start opening your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. And on the way to Luke chapter 10, I'd like to tell you a story. Do you all remember the Ebola crisis? You know, when I wrote this book, we didn't know there was going to be a COVID crisis. But the Ebola crisis had taken place, 2014. This guy right here, do you remember Dr. Kent Brantley? Do you remember this guy? I met this guy when he was six years old. Kent grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana. He is the youngest of six children. His dad and mom, Jim and Jan Brantley, were friends of ours. Jim, his dad, is a doctor. His uncle, Pat Dixon, he's also a doctor. In fact, out of Kent's family, he's got four other siblings that are in the medical field. It just runs in the family. You remember that he went to Sierra Leone. He was a doctor there. Well, his uncle helped start Nigerian Christian Hospital way back in the late 50s and 60s. It's a family tradition. So he was there, and you remember the Ebola crisis struck. And you remember that he in treating others, contracted Ebola, as did another nurse. They had two of those vials, which were supposed to be self-administered to one person. But instead, he took a risk, administered one to himself, one to his fellow co-worker, hoping that it would keep them both alive long enough to get treatment. But that treatment meant bringing them to the United States. You might remember there was a great uprising about bringing them back to the United States. People thought to themselves, you know, tough luck, man. You chose to be a missionary. This is the price of being a missionary. Yes, you're an American, but you ain't coming home like that. But thankfully, love prevailed. They brought them back to Emory Hospital in Atlanta. We live in Atlanta. His uncle is a worship leader with me at our church at the time. So he's in Atlanta. You remember, obviously, he survived. And after that, he came to our church, did an interview with us at the church, shared about what had happened in those circumstances, and then was time person of the year. How many of you remember some parts of that story? He made three observations about the Ebola crisis. He said one of them was is that 
People were just dying in mass. The second one is people didn't understand why their loved ones were dying. He said, but the worst part is that people believe that the medical system, the hospitals and the doctors, were the cause, not the cure. And then Kent made this observation. He said the church is in a similar position. Our communities are sick, dying, and people don't know why. And the church looks more like the cause than part of the cure. Now that stuck with me, and I made a decision. The church owes the world an encounter with divine love. We owe the world an encounter with divine love. But what would it look like? So is your Bible open? Let's begin in Luke chapter 10, and we'll read beginning in verse 25. Everybody ready? On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up and, to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I want you to read with me verse 26 out loud. What is written in the law, he replied, how do you... Say it again. How do you... Right. Now, do you notice what he's asking? What does the law say, what's written in it, how do you interpret that? How do you read it? You see, this is more like a jurist. This is, this is more like someone whose task is to take the law and figure out how to apply the law. Well, here's the man's response. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do you notice that he takes two Old Testament passages and combines them into one? He takes Deuteronomy 6.4, Leviticus 19.18, and puts them into one. That had actually been done 200 years before Jesus. Rabbis combined those two texts into one teaching. You want to know what the whole law is based on? You love God and you love your neighbor in the same way that you learn to love from God. Jesus says to the man, verse 28, you've rep Jesus replied, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, I want you to look at verse 28 again, because in the original language, he says, you've answered correctly, and that word is orthos, from which we get orthodoxy. You've given the orthodox answer. It's like a guy that turns in a paper and the teacher says, A plus, you nailed it. It's like a Bible bull where kids are raising their hands and giving answers, right? And there's a bell that dings and somebody says, you got it. Jesus says, you're right. You have the right orthodox answer. No one can argue with your answer. But the story continues. But the man had a major concern. And what was his major concern? It's right here in verse 29. What was the hottest thing in this man's mind? How do I justify myself? You know what, what, what was the hottest thing in his mind? How do I get out of this? <laughs> right? <laughs> I asked Jesus a question. He asked me for the answer. I gave him the answer, and now I don't like the implications. So i got to figure out a way to unwind this. Right? So wanting to justify himself, uh, he, he asked, well, well, who would my neighbor be? See, right? This is distraction by diffusion. Let's, let's take this answer, go down a rabbit hole. He'll get tired of it, I'll get tired of it, I'll go home and I won't have to do what he just told me to do, right? Oh, but Jesus is on to him. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, that's 12 miles downhill, by the way, when he was attacked by robbers. What did they do? They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and went leaving him away half dead. Now, I don't know if there was like a meter on this guy's forehead that says he's right at half dead. You know, is he three-quarters dead? Is he, is he one-quarter, right, right? But he's half dead. Well, a priest happened to be going down that same road. When he saw the man, he slid over to the other side and walked on by. So to a Levite. When he came to the place, he saw him. He slid over, passed on by. But a Samaritan, 
And that's where you hear the music in the background from the brass section. Boom, 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 right? And this guy comes in. And so they think to himself, now we know what's going to happen. He's going to finish him off. I mean, if it's a Samaritan, he'll finish him off. He sees that the job's half done. He'll kill the man and take whatever's left. No, he's, he's about to introduce the hero. He saw him. He took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. He took him to an inn to take care of him. The next day, so obviously he stayed the night with the man. The next day, he took out two days' wages. Then he gave them to the innkeeper, and he said, Look, you look after him. When I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Well, the expert of the law, well, I, I, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, good job, right answer, or go be like him. So leave tomorrow morning on a business trip Pack a first aid kit. Take a little extra spending money so that forevermore you will be prepared to live like this. Love first means get up with a new mindset, put new things in your travel pack for your daily life, and then as you walk, plan enough time to stop and help the person that God puts in your path. What are you thinking? I ain't got time for that. Right? Man, look, I'm on a schedule. I'm important. I've got people to meet. I've got deals to make. I've got all of these things. I have so many responsibilities in my life. How would I actually fit in planning to live this way. How would I do that? Well, there's another character in the story that doesn't get a lot of press, and that's this innkeeper. Can you imagine, now just think about this, being an innkeeper on a bad stretch of road? Right? Being an innkeeper where it's vulnerable. Being an innkeeper in one of those places that kind of has bars in the windows and chicken wire, right? And all the payments come through a little window, and the glass is real thick because it's bulletproof. That's what this road is like. So the innkeeper is used to living in a place where danger is a part of the process, and yet when this guy gets there, he stays all night and shows the innkeeper how to take care of someone. You see, the Samaritan becomes a teacher to the innkeeper, so the next morning, the innkeeper can live like the Samaritan. And what's he tell the innkeeper? Because this reminds me of circles. He says to the innkeeper, take care of him like you saw me take care of him, and that if, if that is beyond what you can handle financially, I'm going to come back around because together we're going to take care of this man and restore him. Who are you in the story? How many of you at times feel like that you've been the person in the ditch at times? The emotional ditch? the financial ditch, the anxiety ditch, the failed at something that really mattered ditch. Okay? How many of you felt the pain of believing that the next person that was coming is the person you knew that would see you, care about you, stop and help you, and that's the person you put a lot of expectational trust in, and they're the one that slid over and conveniently walked on by your current circumstances? It's very wounding, isn't it? To get to a stage in life where there's no highlight reel to put on Facebook because you're living the low light reel right now. 
And you wonder who else is kind of trying to tell the highlights of the story because we really don't know if there's any Samaritans in the audience that would care enough to hear the story about the ditch and to get into the ditch with us and to risk everything that the ditch meant to us that could now happen to them. Maybe you're the person in the ditch. How many of you felt like you're the Samaritan at times? There's nothing wrong with that. That's not prideful. It's not arrogant. Because I hope, I pray to God that you've been the Samaritan at times. I pray to God that you've been the person that stopped and helped, that recognized a need, that didn't walk by the need. I pray to God that you've been that person. And I'm sure you have. But you realize that at times, Jesus is the one in the ditch. Jesus said, inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. And how many of you are thinking, oh, well, my goodness, if I knew it was Jesus in the ditch, well, of course I'd stop. Jesus said, that's the point. You would stop if you thought I mattered. But I'm trying to get you to see that everybody mattered. You realize at times Jesus is the Samaritan. Jesus shows up wrapped in skin and experience that is so unfamiliar to us, we don't even know if we can trust him. But there's Jesus showing up like a Samaritan. Maybe you're the innkeeper, and maybe even tonight, you've listened to testimonies that people shared, and you're thinking to yourself right now, I want to learn how to do that to care for people like that. You see, one of the challenges that the church faces right now, nationwide, is that we taught people that God loves them unconditionally, Jesus loves them unconditionally, that God proved his unconditional love through Jesus. How many people are we supposed to love? Everybody. What scripture do we quote? John 3, 16, everybody out loud together with me. For God so loved the world. But what if we changed one word? For God so loved this world. The one you're in right now, not a fictitious world, not an ideal world, not an imaginary world, not a world where my political party wins, not a world where the business I care about succeeds, not a world where uh, my interest in the community always get first place. No, not that world. I mean the world that is so confusing you want to put your head under a pillow and not come out. I mean the world where you want to look at your television and scream. I mean the world where you're doom scrolling on your phone and finally you just put it down and think, I can't take it anymore. The world where you see that phone number and you're not sure you have the emotional energy for that call. The world where you're waiting on the medical results. The world where you don't know where your kid is. The world where you don't know how your marriage is going. The world as it is right now. Say it with me. For God so loved this world. Because the world he set his son into looks like this one. Just like this one. Am I right? You know, if you look through your Bible a little bit, you want some evidence. The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to a group of Christians in a, in a city called Corinth. Do you want to know more about Corinth? Take the city of Atlanta and the city of New Orleans and put them into one and you've got Corinth. You put them in one, you got corn. How many of you are thinking to yourself, man, that would be a nasty mixture? Yes! For God so loved the world that he loved Northwest Arkansas. He loves Atlanta. He loved New Orleans. He loves Washington, D.C. He loves Los Angeles. He loves New York. He loves New Delhi. He loves Beijing. He loves Kiev, and he loves Moscow. God so loves this world. Would God give Jesus today? Would God so love the world that he think to himself, it's worth it. For God so loved this world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever, who in the world is the soever? 
Everybody. Amen? Come on now. Everybody. Well, you, you, you understand there's thousands of languages. So everybody from every language group? Yes. Where do we say that? Well, like in a mission meeting. Where do we hear it? From the pulpit. Where is it challenging? When you're watching the news? When you're at a breakfast with some people who have different political opinions? When you're dreading that next family gathering? Come on now. You see, what Jesus is trying to teach us through the story of the Good Samaritan is you don't get to pick your neighbor. You don't get to pick your neighborhood. You just have to live in this world in such a way that you believe that everyone's your neighbor and that you see in them what God sees in them so that when you leave the house in the morning, when you leave your apartment in the morning, wherever you are living, when you go out, you imagine that you are on a mission to love someone closer to Jesus. That's what love first looks like. Now we have five kids. We have four boys and a girl. The fourth son is genetically like me. So when he was in high school, he, uh, he became an expert in decisions that had terrible consequences. <laughs> he knew how to make the most of a losing streak. So I called my dad one day, and I, I was weeping the blues, man. I mean, I was weeping the blues, okay? And I was talking to my dad, and he, my, my dad, a uh, super calm guy, always great. He said, Did ever, you know, first of all, I'd be glad you ain't raising you. All right. He said, did it ever dawn on you that God knew the exact kind of dad that he needed, and he chose you for that job? Well, no, it didn't. But it did send me back to that first year that I lived in Arkansas. Because when I left Oregon, I left here on probation, left there on probation, and I came here facing a trial when I went back on Christmas break. And I got back there. I didn't know how it would turn out. I went to face the judge. My dad was there with me. And there was a conversation. First of all, the judge looked at my dad, but he was talking to me. He looked at my dad, and he said, Mr. McLaughlin, on behalf of Multnomah County Court, I'm sorry that you had to be saddled with a son like that. Those are words you don't ever forget. And for the first time in my life, I thought, he's right. I mean, he's right. He doesn't belong here. He didn't get me here. The way he's treated me didn't put me here. I put me here. And yet here he is. The judge was gracious, paid the fine, gave me my probation, which allowed me to come back here. He left the courthouse. I paid the fine. I worked at Yarnell's Ice Cream saving up money for this. Some of you know about that. My dad would go to court with me. His wallet never made the trip. <laughs> but we left there. We went to a little restaurant in downtown Portland, Oregon. Never forget it. From Mica Top, Chrome Legs, sat down. He looked at me and he said, let me tell you something. I've always loved you. I love you today. And I always will. I didn't deserve an ounce of that. But what stood out to me was that I knew he meant it. And he met the conditions of unconditional love. And now he was calling me to meet those conditions in his grandson's life. He modeled it, showed me how to live it. Now it was going to be on me to decide if I would treat my son as Jesus taught us to treat a neighbor. How many of you got someone in your life 
it came to your mind that this is going to be a bit of a challenge for her. Well, that's why we're doing what we're doing this week. We're calling ourselves to account before the living God to give the world an encounter with divine love. And that starts with love first. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We want nothing more than to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you love this world. You love this world and you love us. You love this person, the person I am, with every last part of me, everything it means to be me. You love that me, and you love these people, this group, right now, tonight. So, Father, I pray that as we explore what it means to love first, that we'll remember that you taught us this, that we may love as you first loved us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.